Good evening, and Good evening. welcome to another episode of the Essex Library's presentation of Centerbrook Architects Lecture Series. The finale for the year, actually, uh, of our 2010-2011 uh, academic year, if you want to put it that way. Um, we have a wonderful speaker tonight, and I, I know you're going to enjoy this. I know it's not probably a, a subject that you might have thought, oh, what a way to spend a Friday night talking about a cemetery, but we'll see. This is really going to be fabulous. But before I start, I should do a little housekeeping. I, I always forget, and it's a typical librarian thing. My name is Ann Thompson, and I'm the head of adult services at the Essex Library. That's why I stand up here every time we have one of these talks. Um, and first and foremost, I want to thank Beth Goodnow and Essex Meadows for uh, allowing us to be in here <coughs> nine times, almost once or twice a month out of, out of their year. Um, and giving us uh, some gracious hospitality that's delicious and nutritious. And I also want to say another thank you to Center Architects because without them, we would not be able to have this series. We just we couldn't put it together. We wouldn't have the ability to garner the kinds of speakers that we can without uh, Center intervention. Um, so the community is very lucky to have them as a patron of the arts, as it were. Yeah. Um, so and now for the most important part, the library housekeeping. Uh, I don't know if you know, you probably don't because we just started this yesterday. Um, it's, it's time for the adults to have a summer reading program. It's, it's high time that the kids don't get all the fun. So we have initiated the inaugural 2011 summer reading group for adults. You can read any six books that you want to. Just drop them down into one of these logs. It'll be available on the website. I have a bunch back on the table. Pick one up as you leave. Um, we have prizes for the uh, at the end of the summer. One will be an e-reader, and we will teach you how to use it if you don't know already. Um, and there will be gift certificates from local vendors. So it's fun to read, and you might as well win a couple of prizes while you're doing it. Um, the other things I want to let you know, since we won't have your rapt attention for the next couple of months, dance is a theme this summer at the library. We've got a, a dance program starting on Tuesday nights in June. Uh, next Tuesday is the first evening at, at the library, and then the rest will be over at Town Hall. Learn how to Eastern Swing. I don't even know what Eastern Swing is, but it looks like a lot of fun. Um, so please come. It, it should be a great time. We've got a professional instructor and all the other classes that she's held. I know the Warners have been involved with and they, they have still survived through all of them and enjoyed themselves. So come, come enjoy some dance. We also have dance on film. So we've got a couple of Jerome Robbins films coming up and there will be one on Friday afternoons. Um, every month over the summer, and I'm certain that if you can get out of the heat and come enjoy something at the library, dance would be fine to watch somebody else do for a change. Um, we've got a bunch of other things going on, summer reading for the kids as always, and lots of stuff um, at the library, individual programs, author talks, and then the summer reading program for adults. So come enjoy yourselves, and now I will introduce Jim Childress, who is our our operative of the CIA, who's found out as much as he could about David Greenbaum, and the CIA is the Centerbrook Intelligence Agency. Um, good. You, the in joke is David is from Washington, D.C. Come on, laugh <laughs> And he's, he's designed the American Spy Museum, so you know how small a building that would be. Oh, doesn't exist. Sorry, really I, will, I will just go away. Here's Jim Childers. <laughs> Appreciate all of you coming. Um, David, I think, is is a real proof that you can be a really great architect and also be a nice guy. Um, I think you'll enjoy this. Um, he, uh, he grew up in Philadelphia, went to Cornell, did his graduate work at Yale, spent uh, a little bit of time here at Centerbrook, which uh, we can claim a little tiny bit of influence on him. And he's gone on to uh, bigger and better places. Uh, landing in Washington, D.C., where he's a vice president of uh, the Smith Group, uh, and he leads their cultural practice. And in that role as an architect, he's designed the, Norman, uh, the Normandy American Cemetery Visitor Center, which he's going to talk about tonight, but as Ann mentioned, he's uh, designed the Spy Museum in Washington, D.C., uh, the National Gallery of Art Sculpture Garden Pavilion. He's doing a visitor center, which he says he can't tell us what the name is because he's sworn to secrecy. Uh, he did the uh, the uh, 
American uh, Indian Museum in Washington, D.C., is working on the American African Museum. You kind of have them all covered, don't you? There's not much left. You're going to redo the White House sometime? <laughs> Paint it with different colors. Um, but uh, I, I asked him to come up and talk, both Ann and I did, about coming up and just talking about this one building. We were privileged to see it a few years ago, not knowing that David had done it. And I must have a gazillion slides of it. And it just it made me think a lot. A very poignant place, obviously. And as an architect, I can't think of anything much harder to do. How to sort of encapsulate um, all that went on there and, and all the people, the conflict that went on. I look forward to hearing what he says. absolutely astounded that there's nothing better on HBO. <laughs> so that's a scary thought to be your Friday night entertainment, but I'll do my best. I want to thank Ann uh, Thompson, Jim Childress for this opportunity to be here and present the Normie American Visitor Center. Um, before we get started, I've been working uh, on museums for over 20 years, uh, starting the National Post and Museum. And um, what I think we've learned over time is, is trying to look at each museum holistically, creating a uh, a, a visitor experience uh, that allows us to shape the architecture around the interpretive mission of the museum. And I think that is that is, a, is an important component, and I'll talk to you about how we've applied that in Normandy as we go through it. Um, it's very easy to do for a story-driven museum. That's a, a museum where the artifacts support a story. And um, as, as uh, uh, Jim had mentioned, I lead a practice, a studio dedicated to cultural work. Uh, we're part of a multidiscipline firm of 800 architects, engineers, and planners. Um, but I've been fortunate enough just to work on a few projects that uh, have, have had to do with museums, performing arts, archival collections, facilities, and so forth. We've worked on all the, the museums on the, on the Capitol Mall, a long legacy there, the National Mall. Uh, worked on the National African American Museum, and uh, uh, which is right next to the National Museum of American History on the Mall as well. Worked on uh, a version of the Mystic Seaport Master Plan, closer to home, and, and as Anne has mentioned, the National, International Spy Museum. Um, just a, a quick tour around some of these. Um, Science City Union Station, restoring the third largest train station, putting the Science Center in that. Uh, National Post and Museum is one image, International Spy Museum. Uh, Library of Congress um, audiovisual collection facility is something we have done, and also the uh, National uh, Gallery of Art down at the bottom right as well. Uh, we've done work uh, on campuses as well, uh, Montgomery College Performing Arts Center, uh, Western Michigan University uh, is a project there, and um, this is a project we're doing currently for St. Mary's College, the Maryland Interpretive uh, Historical Center that's that's down in, in St. Mary's College, uh, in St. Mary's, Maryland. Um, what I think we talk about today is, is is anybody who's experienced World War II, and there may be some among you that have been there, or have studied history, or knows the power of the Normandy invasion and the term D-Day, and those who have watched films like The Longest Day and Saving Private Ryan, got a glimpse into what it was like to be on the beach in Normandy at the time of Operation Overboard. Some 70, uh, 67 years ago, the Allied forces stormed Juno, Sword, Gold, Utah, and Omaha beaches in a few days, actually, June 6, 1944, were part of the largest amphibious assault ever staged and had a goal to liberate mainland Europe from Nazi occupation during World War II. Uh, with total Allied casualties roughly at 10,000, this would, without a doubt, be uh, one of the most sacred and revered places on the face of the earth. Uh, the new visitor center was dedicated back on June 3rd, the 63rd anniversary of D-Day, and the center is intended to tell the stories of those who participated in the landings that day and in subsequent operations. 30 million, 30,000 uh, 30, square foot facility is situated on a cliff overlooking Omaha Beach and is sited within the Normandy American Cemetery. And um, I think, as we like to see it, it expresses a quiet dignity. It supports and complements the hollow ground where 9,380 Americans are buried. And what I'm hoping to do tonight is give you a sense of the program and the site and, and the final result as it ended up getting built out. <laughs> You 
you are about to embark upon the great crusade, the eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. hard to do better than that, but um, I want to start by just uh, reading a brief quote from Eisenhower. He will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. The free men of the world are marching together in victory. I will have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck, and let us all beseech the blessings of the Almighty God upon this great and noble, noble undertaking. Uh, D-Day and Operation Overlord are often regarded as one of the most important operations of all time. The Normandy beaches are, are world famous for that part. They played in June 6, 1944. Well, despite heavy losses, American and Allied troops broke through Hitler's Atlantic wall defenses and began the long-awaited invasion of occupied Europe leading the ultimate defeat of Nazi Germany. If the uh, Normandy landings failed anywhere, it was certain to be at Omaha Beach at Coville Sumer. The heavy losses suffered by American troops on D-Day earned it the name Bloody Omaha. The Normandy American Cemetery Memorial is located on the temporary American St. Lawrence Cemetery established by the U.S. First Army on June 8, 1944, and it's the first American cemetery on European soil in World War II. And of course, here you begin to see some of the original battle images, but I've sort of laced in a couple of images from the longest day. I mean, so this is obviously a well-documented uh, event. Uh, the center here, the new center, will allow us to tell the courageous and inspiring stories of those buried at Normandy American Cemetery. It provides a full array of visitor services to put the DD landings in perspective as one of the greatest military achievements in history. Um, very quickly, uh, you have to ask the question, why was this important? And I, I think for us, the, um, we've got a million visitors coming from, from all over. Um, there are family members and former comrades. Uh, many, most of these are, are, are tourists, though. They come from Europe and, and abroad. And um, the goal of the visitor center is to enhance the visitor's uh, experience as they visit the cemetery. It's not a museum. It's really there to sort of uh, let people know how to take advantage of their visit and give them background to that. Um, and I think giving people the appreciation of the struggle, the courage, the sacrifice of the individual servicemen, and um, showing how democracy has triumphed over dictatorship. Some of the design goals, the visitor center goals themselves, design an effective and efficient facility that complements the center, center with style, cemetery with style and dignity. Uh, develop appropriate messages to increase visitor appreciation and magnitude of the significance, expand public awareness of the American Battle Monuments Commission, 
uh, and their facilities and objectives with regard to honoring the, uh, the America's war dead. The American Battle Monuments Commissioner of the ABMC is a federal agency uh, established in 1923 that maintains uh, 24 commemorative cemeteries and 25 memorials, monuments and markers in 15 countries. Mm -hmm. And um, this is their most visited site. They also did the uh, World War II uh, memorial at the same client. <laughs> get a sense of that. And um, some of our partners here uh, that we collaborated with, very important, Gallagher and Associates for the exhibit design out of Bethesda, Maryland, uh, Michael Ferguson Landscape Architects based in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, Jacobs Engineering helped with uh, uh, civil, structural, mechanical engineering there in, there in Paris, along with Jean Lampros, architect, who we worked very closely with in, in Paris to deliver the project itself. Um, what I, is very striking to me about this uh, is this map, is you get a sense of the cemetery surrounds and, and the deep topography. I mean, you've got about 150 foot rise in grade there. And what you can begin to see, and I'll show you other slides, is the wide beaches uh, that, that uh, troops had to come in under enemy fire here. There were military emplacement bunkers on either sides of the draws, and the ability to cross fire was, was, was fairly as, uh, strong as well. Um, the aerial photograph here begins to show you uh, this rich tapestry of, of farmland divided by uh, a series of uh, what we call bocage or hedgerows, and those are part of the Normandy invasion, but very much part of that landscape. And you see this sort of quasi-grid-like arrangement, and then you see the cemetery with its different axes um, uh, or, organized along the beach area there. And then you begin to see the beach in plan and the water here. And, and the relationship of the beach and, and the water. And, and point out that the cemetery itself covers about 172 acres, uh, all containing the graves of almost 10,000 Americans, and as I mentioned before. That's better. Um, one of the things we did, the first part of the job, was actually have a, a charrette in, in Paris, and a charrette Actually, on site is, is this four-day workshop and meeting with the client where we had um, assembled a group of military history scholars, veterans, museum directors, uh, architects, exhibit designers, and, and began to develop guidelines for the site, develop an architectural program, and uh, some of the major interpretive themes of the, uh, the visitor center itself. Uh, the goal of that first charrette was to give everybody an intensive crash on the history of D-Day, and the full context of World War II. Um, and everybody became very invested in the project. Give you a rough idea of the program, uh, about, uh, about 30,000 square feet, about 11,000 square feet of galleries. There's a lobby, auditorium, office, meeting room, orientation space, and parking for about 500 cars. Um, and I think on this side, you get a sense of the, uh, again, the strong uh, east-west, north-south axes uh, that runs through the site. Uh, parking, existing parking area there. We'd actually come in and walk you through it, but come through this uh, ceremonial walk, there's a little visitor center, and you'd actually come through and meander around the site here. Here you can get a sense of the boundaries of the site as well. Um, I have to say, working in, in, in France clearly had its perks at, at 10.30 in the morning on the first day of the charrette. We were staying at a golf club, and they served oysters and champagne. Um, <laughs> but not expecting this, our client didn't want to set up some bad precedents, so they quickly ended that practice. Um, but after that charrette, needless to say, uh, everybody was very close and kept in constant contact, um, and very worked very hard to, to have a very seamless project. Um, and since story was most important, we really had to work very tightly with 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 Gallagher and, and Ferguson to to really help uh, shape that experience. Uh, I'm going to, again, point out the east and west axes are very important, and also point out that the axes, uh, the ordinance, if you will, of, of, of the, uh, the landscape is on a different, different orientation. Um, but, but I think that's, um, um, that was something we found as a nuance and something we'll talk about a little bit later here. Uh, again, as the circulation sequence work, you actually come through the front gate here, you would park the car, and, and move on past the restrooms if you want, through the ceremonial entrance, and then walk uh, through a meandering path, eventually wind your way up the water view, and these are all views back to the waterfront. And, and why do we chart this? We chart this because 
we knew we had to have a, uh, a visitor center. We, we really wanted people, we don't have to do that, but we wanted people to come there first. So we needed to understand how they would circulate through the, through the cemetery and, and, and so forth. And that was a really important part of the story. Uh, down to the bottom left, you can see a 1957 image of when it first came in. And, and you'll be able to see in a moment how much the landscape became an integral part of that whole experience. Um, Here's a, a nice aerial image. You can see the very strong stand of, of evergreens as it wraps around the site. The parking over time had become a very large window, a large room, uh, particularly compared to this beautiful room, contained space, and this room as well. We thought that was something we needed to pay some attention to to begin to change the scale of that. Um, caretaker's house here, uh, the original visitor center, which was about a 20 by 30 foot room. Imagine getting a million people a year through that. That was a bit difficult. Um, and I think the, the um, memorial, as it stands with the reflecting pool and the chapel down below, get a sense of that. And the Garden of the Missing is just tucked behind here. Uh, another vantage point here, uh, just want to point out um, uh, actually a nursery that sits within here, and of course the cliff as it, as it runs along the site, very uh, dramatic drop to that um, and the perimeter wall that actually encapsulates the project all of these are are things that, that sort of gave us clues as we move forward on the project we actually looked at three different sites but this one seemed to make the most sense uh, for a number of reasons that was a short distance to the cemetery it had expansive views uh, out potentially uh, across that open field and um, it was um, uh, and also back to, to the uh, to the, uh, uh, the channel, uh, but it was also strategically placed so we could bring people in and back out of that, um, into the cemetery without disturbing the, the importance and the, and the ceremony there. Now I'm going to try to take you on a quick windshield tour of Normandy, just get a sense of that. Um, these are beach views, obviously, um, very um, strong landscape here. Very wide beaches, uh, the rise uh, of, of the land. You actually can see the draws to either side of that, the machine gun and, and bunkers to either side. Um, beautiful views off the top of the, of the site as it is. And um, again, very dramatic sweeping, sweeping landscape that goes along with it. Um, this is actually on the cemetery uh, proper, and I'm taking you through a north-south experience. This is actually, the, as you drive through, uh, you actually come to the ceremonial area here, and then you would walk through this gate uh, and, and, and begin to walk your way down to the cemetery straight, if you wanted, straight down to the water to this table where you would overlook the cemetery itself to either side uh, from the cemetery and actually look out to the channel. This walks along the, uh, the side of the channel itself, and this is a view sort of turning back towards the memorial. One thing that's very striking that I, I do want to mention is the uh, that red paving, um, which is which is really uh, asphalt paving, which which basically takes you through the whole cemetery itself. Again, some of the memorials itself, as it, as it stands, just some of the views uh, used rich uh, French limestone, contrasting with that verdant landscape. Absolutely manicured precision uh, in terms of, of all the trees and the grasses. Uh, it's really quite a, a wonderful. Some to give you a sense of the, of the white crosses, and the sort of the, these are all set on steel beams, and they're all on this incredible camber and grid. Um, the actual uh, crosses themselves, the, the, the um, engravings face west, back towards the United States. So when you're actually standing at the memorial, you don't actually see the names. So they're actually turned the other direction. And again, you can see the precision and the maintenance, not a blade of grass out of place. So the ABMC takes great care of that, it's very important. And off to one side here, you can see the First Division Memorial for World War One. This is the Garden of the Wall, uh, Garden of the Missing, and then a view from the from the um, memorial, and that's looking out towards our site. And that's an important view because we want to maintain that beautiful vista of the horizon. Um, get a sense of the, the Normandy landscape setting. Uh, just a very bucolic setting, very sculpted. Um, the, the, 
landform it has a lot of clay in it, so they're able to sort of carve away the land at very steep angles of propose, which is very nice um, and, and attractive. And of course, the, the Normandy stone walls and the slate roofs are, are something that's all part of that, that language as well. Uh, this is the actual site we, we, we ended up building on, and I'm going to point out a few things. There's a beautiful walk to the left. In the center, there are rows of trees that actually line up as part of the nursery, but they stagger in, 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 in different directions here. And I think this is a site of, of uh, uh, contrasting landscapes. You look to the right, and, and there's a hedgerow there with a beautiful view back down to the, to the water and off to our launch, which is nearby, a back view back to the memorial, and then to the side of the site, again, an open farming field, which is uh, quite beautiful. Um, what is really memorable, too, is all of these uh, trenches and anti-aircraft gun emplacements and bunkers are, are here, and they're strong reminders of the past, and you can't avoid them. And they dot the landscape. And one thing that impressed me was this uh, view from the bunker, this uh, very dramatic slot, what the Germans saw from the landscape. We think that was something that was really interesting, to give their perspective looking at this as, as we move through it. Um, and all of this, of course, is slowly deteriorating in the air uh, due to the salt air. Sorry. Um, we, we probably looked at over um, 30 uh, different design ideas on, the, on a few sites here, uh, some with 50% of the building buried. Some with a, the program you know, fully uh, engaged on one floor, but we clearly found that 30,000 square feet was going to overpower the whole, the whole site. So we quickly started to look at schemes where we'd actually folding the site in, in at least in half. Um, I think for us, uh, some of the goals out of the, uh, the uh, charrette included um, that the, the cemetery always has to be the primary focus. and. The visitor center has to always be in balance with the cemetery and support the cemetery. Uh, it, it has to maintain the solemnity and, and, and surroundings and not undermine the power to power the cemetery experience. So we started developing a series of principles and goals that talked about respecting the natural features of the site, <laughs> celebrating the uniqueness of the West and the open field and the draws to the East, uh, beginning to talk about symbolism and the architecture to express the struggles of Operation Overlord. One of the ideas we had was that they came from the air, land, and sea. We tried to find a way to incorporate that within the design. Um, integrate all the interpretive experience with the architecture and the landscape as well, a very critical piece. And then trying to respond to seasonal weather and peak visitation demands, providing covered roof areas so people could go out and enjoy themselves when the weather was nice. And then starting to look at setting the building on the footprint of the compass ordinance north, south, east, and west. Um, which is the same orientation of the bocage in the field, something different than the cemetery. Again, we wanted to break that from a ceremonial experience and an educational experience. We wanted to break the orientations. Um, we examined linear concepts and fully underground concepts that had open air cloisters. And part of the key experience here is that inter inter interpretation of the landscape and trying to interact and respond to the immediate site conditions. Um, the site needs to integrate the cemetery path system into the visitor center. And we, there's a whole network of paths that actually cross the site and reach out to various parts um, uh, around to different memorials. And we thought it was important to tie all that together, but also make the cemetery visitor center part of the walking path. Um, and, and I think part of it, what we learned was condensing that footprint allowed the program to double up on itself, reducing the presence and keeping the building from being a barrier to those expansive beaches. The uh, goal of the visitor center is to say for future generations the cultural and political significance of historic events that took place on the site. And since so many people come visit, uh, we've got coming by car, tour bus, RVs, on foot, bicycles by local, it's a huge demand on the facility grounds. And again, as we started to look at uh, some of these connecting paths, um, one of our first tasks was to actually look at the, at the parking lot and actually break it down in size because it was such a big space uh, as you sat there, almost a room. We wanted to not compromise 
um, that room and that room, uh, which were very important. And I, so when I say room, I mean outdoor space. Uh, so the, for one of the first things we did was try to look at a, a, a way to begin to engage a path that would bring people through the building. You start to see it uh, beginning to mass here against the edge of the hedgerow here uh, with a relationship uh, uh, against the east-west uh, axis of the cemetery and now the, the axes, if you will, of the Bocage. Uh, and then began to develop a series of parking bays that would break that up, um, making it much less formal. Um, eventually, we really resolved and started to refine a linear uh, process scheme, and this is, these are some tests on here, but I think one of the pieces that really pushed us in that direction is the client wanted to develop a one-way experience, uh, meaning that somebody would come in the door one way and we'd put you out somewhere else and send you on a path, and I think that was pretty important, and a linear scheme helped do that. Um, so it was important to us to not uh, confuse clarity of visitor circulation, again, creates a uh, separate circulation sequence for the cemetery and the visitor center, uh, differentiate between that ceremonial cross access and the meandering paths, make it clear to the visitor where the cemetery starts and where it stops, uh, integrate that landscape with the experience by celebrating micro landscapes, cemetery, rolling terrain, and channel within the experience itself, providing screen views that unfold as people enter the building, provided frame views for panoramic landscapes, uh, make the parking integral that visitor experience, because your visit starts as you drive down the path and you enter the cemetery and wanted people to look at it very holistically. And then try to be an intermediary, intermediary between the monumental language of the cemetery and the surrounding Normandy architectural vernacular. Um, and Rick, I'm going to take you through a quick couple of the key themes in the exhibit, because I think they're pretty important. Um, recognizing the generations after World War II were becoming progressively unaware of the historical significance of this place, uh, the center is designed to enhance and enlighten uh, the visitor experience by conveying the immense significance of the event. And there were several key points that we wanted to get across. I mean, understanding the importance of D-Day in the larger context of the World War II, uh, the selection of Normandy as the invasion site on June 6 as the invasion date, the enormous challenge facing over Operation Overlord, the ge geography, the, the logistics, the enemy resistance, and why did Overlord succeed and how did the success pay for the liberation of Europe? And out of this came these organizing premise of uh, your theme is competence, courage, and sacrifice. And these are the three major things we, we had to, to, to cope with. And, and keep in mind, as you go through a visitor center, we had uh, we wanted to get people within and out of this in, in 45 minutes. It was really important to to move very quickly through that experience, so people wanted to go see the cemetery. Uh, key themes for the uh, competence section, uh, talk about the meticulous planning and preparations for D-Day, training of the troops, including the special units, such as chaplains, medics, combat engineers, signal, signal corpsmen, uh, some of the demolition units, new technologies and new techniques, the landing craft, the new vehicles and special units, how American troops overcame the accidents and problems, unforeseen complications or avoidable as an aspect of the cross-channel attack. Um, in terms of courage, we, we wanted to focus on Eisenhower's momentous decision to invade despite uncertainty, the bravery of the U.S. Navy, the Royal Navy, the Coast Guard, personnel who navigated their small crafts through rising tides and treacherous surf and withering enemy fire, the relative youth of the fighting men and the assault force, most were, most were in their late teens or early 20s, the courage of the American officers who endured the same, some of the highest casualty rates in Western European, Western European theater of war, and the courage of the enlisted men that continued to fight uh, on their personal initiative after the officers perished. And it, the last one is uh, sacrifice. Uh, again, the, uh, some of the elements there uh, in that section. Uh, each grave represents an individual need to attach faces and stories to the cold casualty numbers. Sacrifice of the survivors who carried their own physical and psychological star scars. <coughs> Broad impact of D-Day casualties, effect on families and loved ones at home. Each loss represented a, a hole left in American society. The importance of the sacri sacrifice, liberation of Europe, and the triumph of democracy. Um, very quick 
quickly, the, uh, we also had one piece to bring forward, which is again the origins of the mission of the APMC, the historic history of the, the Normandy Cemetery site, and the importance of honoring our four dead. Uh, as we started to, to further develop the plan, um, oops. Yeah, just in case you missed it. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, again, we see developing of the parking area as you come in, the entry sequence, use of uh, green grass paving, um, introduction of a rain garden element here, which was meant to take all of the uh, rainwater coming off the parking lot and clean it and, and put it back into the, into the uh, ecosystem. Uh, the development here, of clarity of a, of a new pathway coming through here. You can start to see certain key elements here. Uh, this is what we call the orientation pavilion, which gives somebody coming out of the parking area after the drop-off a, a place to decide, do I go ahead to the cemetery, to go into the visitor center? Exterior restrooms, I can't tell you how much time we spend on those exterior restrooms. <laughs> uh, but they were important. And um, uh, beginning to set up the different relationships of view, there's an oculus here, reflecting pool, and a Normandy garden. Again, this idea of they came from the air, land, and sea, starting to wind that in. Um, and, and starting to, to talk about a reflecting pool actually opens up, the brings a channel actually into the, into the building itself. And then a, a view back to the uh, memorial so people know where they are. Um, very important to set up these decision points as we move through it. And uh, also, uh, I think, um, what I find important is that people need to understand their bearings before they can start to take in some of the intellectual uh, orientation we want to bring forward. So they have to know where they are first before they're ready to do that. Um, some earlier images of the, of the studies of the building. Very early on, we had this sense that we wanted two different facades. Um, one that was very glass on the east side looking out. One that was a little more protected on the wooded side. And um, you can begin to see uh, the sense of, of wanting to bring the channel in to the building. And, and why do we do that? Well, if, you know, if you're driving from Paris for four hours, you come into the site, you've never seen the water. And it seemed to us that the water was the most important thing to start with, to start the story. And we wanted people to see that and, and have uh, <laughs> that be their start, because that's where the experience started <laughs> as far as the uh, invasion took. Um, some models here again, uh, some other studies again, we, we looked at, at, at these two scales, the wooded scale on the one side and the open field on the other. And you can just see sort of the initial ideas of something more solid on one side with a series of stone walls and more glass. Inserted in there is a, a room called the Next of Kin Room, which is um, a place, we had a very sweet superintendent who was very concerned about a lot of the people that would come here and a lot of time and effort to make it to the site. Once they got to the cemetery, if they were visiting family, they would just break down and cry because it was such an emotional charge to get there. And he really wanted a place for people to get out of the public eye and, and actually spend time. So that became a very important part of the program. Um, again, this, this notion here of folding the building on itself, we basically had this, this pavilion at the top that was glass, and the reflecting pool sits here, and you get a sense of that. There we had a very dramatic view, and of course this idea of showing you the bunkers, and, and, and somehow that, that impression stayed in our mind about this, trying to create a framed view of the landscape. We thought that was very important. But what we noticed was by folding the building in half, was we were able to create two different environments, two worlds. Um, Again, we had this idea that you would have a place for that physical orientation, looking out uh, to the beach, looking out to our marsh, across the, uh, the, the gardens, and then coming down into a new experience that would be uh, perhaps like entering World War II. Here it became fairly quiet upstairs, but more active and, and, and more acoustically uh, uh, echoey. Uh, we wanted that. We wanted the, uh, the sensibility 
uh, of a highly polished and, and finished upstairs to transform itself into a more concrete and, 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 and rustic interior. Um, and I think part of that is to, to again, dramatize the difference between the, the different spaces themselves. Um, earlier image is showing one of the perspectives of, of the approach. Uh, we were struggling with the, with the front door here and how we'd actually enter the space itself. In this case, it's 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 uh, two series of two walls and two horizontals. Again, the glass to the right. This this started is an early thing, beginning to show the landscape marsh as a way to filter your view. You get uh, peaked views out to the landscape itself. Another view from the east side, which is all fairly glass at that point, uh, low horizontal, uh, very low horizontal uh, slabs, but very open. And this was a view we, we thought about in terms of uh, developing the, the, the area below that pavilion, which was basically all concrete, and we wanted to interject a little bit of wood. But we had this notion of what it might be like to put a, 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 a camouflage net over that space. In this case, it might be a stainless steel grid. And early, we also started thinking about um, giving the visitors always some impression of light uh, in the building. It's very important. It's an outdoor experience. We didn't want to close that off. People, uh, people eyes need, need time to acclimate as you go from the inside and the outside. So we brought in, looked at bringing in east light and top light to provide a, a very balanced light in the, in the space, but different orientations as well. Um, these are some studies on the, on the competence gallery, and these exhibits are self-guided, so it's very easy for people to go in and, and get oriented, and there's a logical flow of those exhibit areas. They're also focused heavily on individual stories. We're not providing textbook history lessons, and the reason we did this was so people could make a personal connection. And I think for many who visit the cemetery, parents and grandparents are the image of World War II veterans, and what's often lost among the younger generations is that most of those lying in the cemetery were very young, many still in their teens or 20s when they were killed, and, and we want to convey that to them and let them know, especially school kids, that these individuals were, were not much older than they were. Uh, here the exhibit cases have this very staccato rhythm, and they're, they're sort of marching uh, in, in a platoon formation. We thought that was absolutely deliberate. Uh, we tried to change the scale as you move through the different areas of the exhibit themselves. Um, this is the, the last gallery, uh, the Sacrifice Gallery, and um, this is one of the toughest things we had to do. I mean, there were loud debates in the office on how do you express sacrifice and death in architecture, and uh, where we ended up on this was this um, twin cube shaped meditation chamber. These twin elements of, of uh, one out of Corten steel, which is a, a rust red steel. Uh, the other is a glass box. And on the Corten box, it's actually sealed with glass, so you can't actually go in there. What we were trying to do is um, have this void that confronts and, and confounds visitors about the emptiness left by death. It's sort of an allegorical reference to the spirit after death, which is a reference to light and sky. And um, here you can see some, some earlier studies about struggling about that. We, we shaped it in, a, in a, uh, an oval elliptical space room and uh, cladded it in acoustical plaster. So when you actually go in, it's, it's extremely dead quiet. Mm -hmm. I thought that was important too, to sort of contrast some of the other, the other uh, places at, at bay. And I think what we, we, we used here in terms of the idea of not just using light, but also using sound as ways to shape the room and the experience that you have when you go into a space. It's very important. Um, earlier views of the garden wall, again, one of the goals was to always get this diagonal transparency through the building. Um, there's a model there that starts to show the wooded area up at the top and then the open field to the other side. Um, that's the pavilion, the reflecting pool, and the sacrifice gallery. Uh, another version of this, as we started to learn, we ended up making a much higher um, wall that began to divide these two different scales and wanted people to slide into the building much like the trees were 
as they were had these rows and then they would slip between the rows. We thought that was the nicest way to sort of slide into the building and then have a much more formal relationship to the water. And here in this view, you can see the plinth is more is more pronounced and, and we've added actually a little more heft to the next of kin space and begin to see some of the exhibit elements within the space itself and the roof and tenant is just float right against the uh, landscape against that wall. Um, this is um, a view at the exit way and, and one of the things I need to say is that what was wonderful about Normandy, it's a magnificently beautiful yet poignant site and you can sit there in a day and experience all four seasons. So the weather is always changing and the weather is um, so important, it was so important to the invasion and um, anywhere we could introduce uh, and show aspects of rain and water, we did, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but um, this is just showing a view, uh, an earlier view, exiting out of the Sacrifice Gallery, and I remember I mentioned this idea of being a one-way experience. Here you would actually come up around the landscape, uh, rise to the horizon, see the water, and then walk around to the cemetery, and that was all important to begin to think about that um, as, as people uh, exited the place, and this was a continuation of the path back to the visitor center So, um, We spent a lot of time analyzing the site, looking at uh, just different materials, uh, all sorts of different finishes, the rough chiseled flamed and honed finishes, the granite, the limestone. These are all some of the existing places where the stone was used. We wanted to reintroduce the stone as part of that to make the building feel grounded in the site. It's very important to us to bring, bring around the channel wall to this side of the site. Um, these are some of the walls here, the uh, walls from the Garden of the Missing, the entry walls, the, the wall along the channel, and give you a sense of the, of the Vorion limestone and the, and the Brittany granite that was there, and the red asphalt, uh, which is very dominant again throughout the place. Um, Again, sense of some of the material studies, uh, we found this wonderful um, limestone, actually it's African limestone that has uh, it's a cashmere white that when you look at it in closer inspection, it has these uh, occlusions in it that actually look like droplets of blood. And we were able to bring that in uh, as, as a floor in, in, in the space as well. Also looked at different types of granites and then we brought in pebbles from the beach, not literally from the beach, but to, to begin to set up different floor pavings that would bring the beach, beach stones back to the, to the building itself. Uh, the image on the bottom right is a process uh, we developed called the Form Molded Stone, which is Brittany, actually Brittany granite embedded in the concrete wall. Again, trying to sort of resurrect and bring back the Normandy landscape into the building as well. And here you can begin to see in this plan the sort of the, the different diagonal views that you might be able to get through the, uh, the building itself. Again, different finishes is a uh, uh, Rustenberg Neuro Impala uh, granite. And um, uh, on the other side, where we're actually using uh, uh, the four molded stone and the uh, uh, zinc clad, zinc coated <coughs> copper roofing. <coughs> Quick detail studies here, uh, showing the contrast uh, on the plinth of these. What we ended up doing here was actually offsetting the stone a little bit to provide some heavy rustication on the wall, uh, give it some, some, some solidity, but also some, some, some tighter scale. And uh, within that, looking down at the floor paving, uh, part of bringing the outside in meant we had to bring certain paving material inside and out, so we want to be careful about where we transition <coughs> the two together. That was important for us to begin to look at that. And again, sort of looking at contrasts of the rough four molded stone and the, and the more highly uh, sharp cut home granite with glass and stainless steel. Some of the um, landscape elements, each, each um, aspect of landscape was carefully studied by our landscape architect, uh, Michael Ferguson, looking at the entry sequence the different vignette views, very important as we start to walk through the site to get diagonal views through the site, through, through different sites of the, of the beachfront. And then again, um, looking at how the reflecting pool is going to place uh, a role in the, in the experience itself.
One thing we also looked at here was bringing in this aspect of the Normandy flooded landscape, uh, which is very typical there. We introduced this rain garden to begin to recreate that and introduced a series of, of, of local plantings to reinforce the idea of the Normandy landscape as well. Creating a formal arrival point, uh, using vegetated swales in the parking area to uh, uh, clean the water before it goes back to the natural water course and uh, provide uh, paved areas for the drop-off and potentially a bridge over the rain garden. Uh, we introduced uh, hedgerow and seaside landscapes uh, in a number of areas as well. These are the natural ones, but this was very much part of that world. We wanted to replant that and rebuild that because that was part of the, the whole uh, invasion of Normandy having to deal with the bocage and the hedgerows. Enemies, uh, enemy would hide behind there. We would try to, to take the land and have to crash through these bocage, and it was a, a very big deal to actually try to break through the landscape as we understood it. And then introducing where we can uh, certain natural grasses uh, and, 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 and hedgerows along these edges again to shape that to shape that landscape and begin to bring it into the cemetery it was very much part of the thing that we were looking at. And I also had to pick a salt and wind tolerant landscape material too, shrubs and trees, so they could withstand the uh, constant wind speeds. And. One thing, as people exited this, we thought it was really important to turn their attention back to the cemetery. So what we started to introduce were some of the clipped evergreens and the red asphalt walks and, and, and some of the pristine nature. So people felt they were returning back to the cemetery as well. Um, construction, so construction view started uh, in January 2006. And um, again, you can see the very steep angle of repose here that they could cut through the soil, there's high amounts of clay. And of course, the farmers have been using that to their advantage for years. Um, they're starting to build a theater um, auditorium space and slip forming this into this trench. Um, this is a view from the uh, tower crane. I'm glad I didn't have to take the picture, but um, you can get a sense of the scale of that down at the bottom right there. And you can see the development of the parking lot through this view and off to the beach. And this is the Sacrifice Gallery. This is that exhibit box that's being built, you know, the theater as well, back in about March of 2006. Uh, here they are adding uh, waterproofing and insulation on it. Again, starting to see the sense of that connecting walking trail and how it's going to sort of connect uh, down to the other trails there. And here they've actually added some of the framing material uh, on the space and starting to build the steel structure there. Again, the, using the parking lot at that point for the cemetery. It's still under construction, of course, but um, starting to see that begin to form. And these are more ground level shots, just showing you the um, original images and, and how these started to begin to um, look like we drew them. <laughs> was a big surprise. Um, we did change the, the stone to something a little bit more smoother. It was still honed, but you could begin to see the undulations in the stone uh, being fairly pronounced even at a distance here. And that view through the woods, uh, very much something we wanted to keep. Um, view of the lobby under uh, construction here is an initial view of the reflecting pool and, and, and the openness of that lobby before some of the stonework's gone in, but you could begin to get a sense of that, that notion of compression and the views that you might have seen uh, back in 1944 if you were on the opposing side. Um, ribbon cutting, uh, June 6, 2007. Uh, Defense Secretary Gates and French Min Defense Minister Hervé Morin were there. It was a, a rainy and foggy day, and the helicopters couldn't land until the fog blew, uh, burned off a little bit. And the ceremony started, uh, that I remember, with the sounds of the frogs uh, making sounds in the reflecting pool. So that was the highlight of my visit there. Uh, but um, and, and one thing that was very interesting is, is during this project, the Iraq War broke out, and there were clearly different pos uh, positions and tensions with the French about our involvement. Um, but I think it was pretty clear uh, 
even through this ceremony and others and talking to them that you know we've been allies with the French since the American Revolution and, and I think this was something that we were going to get beyond and it certainly didn't see any evidence here in Normandy on that day. Um, these are some more of the, the finer uh, finish shots, but I think you get a sense here of the uh, orientation pavilion, which pavilion, which is that place you first would 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 step and see and look at a map, uh, maybe understand what's in 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 the visitor center itself and where the cemetery grounds are, and you from there would walk on to the building itself. And I point out these are I've got a few shots here where the landscape's actually more mature. But these will give you an idea for the basic components. <coughs> Here we're looking at the drop off of the bridge over the rain garden. Um, there's a view of the landscape that I mentioned that's started to grow in. We actually have a, a solid screen there. You get a very good sense of the orientation pavilion, the ceremonial drop off at either side. Another view standing with the, underneath the orientation pavilion. Uh, since it rained so much, uh, at, at a short notice, we really wanted to have places for people to stand to get under cover very quickly. Um, so part of this was uh, needed for uh, uh, just just to get out of the rain. Um, this is the building looking from the memorial area itself, and again, you can see the low horizon, almost like a secondary wall, um, but still keeping the sky open, and that was very important to us to keep everything fairly suppressed, low profile. View from the uh, uh, presidential walk, looking at, at, the, uh, at the building itself, landscape still growing in at this point. Uh, again, see, actually you can see through the building, even standing here orientation pavilion to the right and the sacrifice uh, galleries covered by a green roof so you don't see it in that shot. Um, one of the thoughts that somebody had said, and we certainly didn't think about this way, but you can see how the stones are not aligning and somebody had said that the stones have been rattled from the constant bombardment of the war. Of course we'd love to hear that because it means that people somehow connected it and we hadn't saw it in a different way than we had. Um, you get a sense of the promenade path as it walks down. Again, that's all finished in, in, a, in a pebble stone all the way down to the water's edge. Quotes are laced throughout the building itself. This is the entrance area as well. And we cut out openings where you can see frame views back to the water and back to the, uh, uh, along the coastline, trying to keep that perforated as much as we can. And this is a view uh, looking west out in the field. Um, it was very important to us and the, uh, uh, the local review body that wanted to keep any signs of the building away from the landscape and the ocean. They were very worried about seeing a building on the landscape. But we also liked the idea of, of setting the building behind a hedgerow and trying to disguise it as much as possible. So from the, from the lobby itself, you can see out. And as this hedgerow grows in, um, a lot of the building will be blended into the landscape. Here's that next of kin room we, we had talked about that was part of that. Again, that place for the people to go to pay their respects uh, and get out of the public eye. Um, you begin to see the four molded stone along the baseline. And I'll point out a number of rain scuppers and get a little better shot of it on the next slide. But it's uh, we actually developed a screen uh, a series of louvers that would actually dissipate the water into a series of droplets. So when you're standing out on this loggia overlooking the landscape, the relationship with the water and the rain was all part of that experience. And these runnels, again, would collect the water and bring them down into a, uh, uh, an area for cleaning before they went off into the, into the, into the system. Standing on that loggia, we wanted, since it was an outside experience, we wanted people to come out and, and see the landscape, and it was very important to do that. Um, and, and it also expanded the dimensions of the lobby itself uh, and um, helped frame that, those views of the landscape. Um, part of the section study, uh, even though this wasn't a mandate, we made a lot of sustainable design decisions. Um, 
in, in spite of it, because uh, we felt it was the right thing to do. Uh, spent a lot of attention looking at solar angles and how they would work. Uh, this section, you start to see the two different scales of the wall, the idea of the rain coming off um, and, and draining back into runnels. Um, light coming from multiple directions to provide balance of light and, and minimize uh, intensity uh, and, and, and too much glare and slowly introduced uh, ideas of, of raised flooring to actually introduce air conditioning lower at the floor, which is called displacement um, ventilation, and then ventilating the hot area uh, up, up through the roof, um, which was important, I think, and, and gave the uh, project a little bit more flexibility in terms of, of how they would use the space as well. <coughs> um, here is the uh, developed plan orientation pavilion, the drop-off. Um, we'd actually <laughs> slide into the building this way, actually enter the lobby and administrative offices, the next to pin space, the ABMC gallery, the reflecting pool, and, and a sight line along that axis, which is very important, back to the memorial so you can see where you were going or where you've come from, and then a view out uh, through to the landscape and this oculus above your head. Uh, and this, this is a, a view of the reflecting pool as you're looking out that way. And then stairs that would bring you down um, uh, into the into the exhibit area. Also, could could leave if you, if you didn't want to see it. Um, view of the lobby itself with the overview gallery and the sign-in visitor sign-in books and the Oculus there. Uh, skylight along one edge, the stair to the left. Again, the reflecting pool ahead of you. Close-up view of the ABMC gallery and a view through the building. Again, looking at the transparency. This is a low iron glass, but it's fairly thick pieces, and we had to work very hard to make sure it had the right kind of transparency. Also, uh, some of the ceilings here are using acoustical plaster, which is, is, is helps with sound absorption as well. It's a view uh, looking from the. Uh, lobby out towards the reflecting pool. There's an interpretive map that's there as part of that, showing the, uh, the invasion, describing the expanse of land that took place. The infinity pool, of course, bringing the water right into the lobby. And that horizontal frame landscape, all starting at the water. Um, the steps, again, are bringing you back down. Um, very important. Again, those two wheel, uh, two worlds of peaceful landscape above and descending into war below. Uh, again, the lobbies above and the get a sense of as you're, you're looking down this way in that view to the left, theaters below that, and the galleries are below in that area as well. Um, view of the uh, 190 seat theater uh, auditorium. Again, it's finished out with a, a, a lattice work, um, um, uh, all done in French oak. This is uh, 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 the offices upstairs. Um, gotta love the French codes. For some reason, they like to have natural light and natural ventilation in every place that's occupied by, by humans. Who ever thought of something like that? It's a great idea. <laughs> um, so they had, they got to enjoy that. We don't so much, but. <laughs> That's the way it seems to go sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, this is the uh, the lobby outside the theater. It's a real decision point. You go left of the exhibits, right to the lobby itself. Each uh, space seemed to be an opportunity to present new information here, uh, talking about uh, introducing the theme of democracy being threatened. And um, you get an idea of the lower plan here with the auditorium is coming down the steps, the lobby that I just showed you, and the layout of the exhibit, Confidence and Courage Sacrifice Galleries. This is the uh, uh, courage or uh, confidence, and then courage begins to shift on a bias, uh, begins to get a little bit shaken, but still has the same order, and guides you through a connecting tunnel into the sacrifice gallery. And it's that terminus of that gallery, it's a passageway that guides people um, into the, uh, into the area that was, uh, again, these that have sort of died in the campaign. And you will encounter those two, uh, two cubes of uh, 
Cortan and glass on, on, on the plan as you come into that space. And from there, people would exit out along the ramp and wind their way back up to the channel and then off to the cemetery. Give you an idea of the, of the um, courage gallery here. Again, very raw concrete box, um, much darker than it was upstairs. We, we brought in this uh, stainless steel mesh and again to see the, the uh, all the steel exhibit panels are actually projecting on the concrete as, as part of that experience, sort of the rawness of that, trying to evoke some sensibility of war and, and the roughness um, while people can look at film, look at artifacts, and uh, some of the interactives that are in the space itself. This is a close-up view of one of the gallery exhibit panels. You can see we've introduced the beach pebbles again base of those so that people are always taken back to the beach. Brought in, in, in two languages here in French and English. And a view of the uh, courage gallery. Again, the shifted grid, as you will, relative to the ceiling. Again, the, the netting above and uh, some of the exhibit cases close up. This is a view towards the end as we get into the sacrifice tunnel itself. Uh, again, the theater at the end projected on the concrete, uh, which we thought was misappropriate, and then introduced into the tunnel itself. And then what's unique about the tunnel uh, as you connect into this space is uh, it's all concrete, except now we have a smooth granite stone wall uh, representing the order of society coming back to bear. And you can hear the names of many of the soldiers who were buried out whispered in as you walk through the path, uh, which we thought was an important way to transition from that exhibit experience into the next. And here you can begin to see that the final design features, again, all bathed in acoustical plaster, elliptical space, light around the perimeter, <coughs> and the, uh, the two cubes in the center. Um, sort of the calmness reinforced by the acoustical deadening and this oval, very soft space, again, evoking the uh, shapes of the memorial of the chapel in the, in the cemetery itself. And around the perimeter are these glass uh, stele uh, with photographs of, of those that have died and personalized um, around the perimeter of the space. At the center of the cubes here uh, is the uh, uh, rifle and the uh, helmet. Center, which is this icon of, of, of soldier dying. Now, again, you can't actually you can't walk in there, but you can sense that. We thought that was an, an important icon to put in the in the center of this exhibit. Another view of that space and some of the some of the stele in terms of what those panels look like, all backlit, sitting around the room. There's a view looking at the epilogue gallery as you exit out the space. Um, on the back exit way, you actually come out through that door. Um, just get an idea of the section here, the sacrifice gallery with a green roof, visitor path, reflecting pool, and the courage gallery. And you'll see the different transition in materials. As you move through the space, we had the, uh, the uh, uh, rough stone, uh, granite up above and the four molded stone below and here we've introduced the limestone to take you back to the, the cemetery finishes. So the building transforms itself as, it move, as you move through the site. <coughs> and uh, a view uh, of the uh, exit ways you come around and again the crosses. And I want to read a quote here which is, you, you the veterans are the reasons we come back here every year. I know this trip doesn't get any easier for you each year but we must not forget changed the world, you could have hid, you could have run, but instead you stayed and fought, and you fought for freedom. <laughs> President Barack Obama. I have some, I think, some gratuitous night shots here. Um, this is one just looking uh, from, the, from the overlook of Loja back to the, to the channel. Uh, one's with the photographer's feet standing in the reflecting pool, looking back um, towards the, uh, the lobby itself. <coughs> and then 
light shot from the orientation of William. And I, I think that's it. I don't know if there are any questions, I'm happy to, happy to answer them.